So thank you all for coming. I'll mention some housekeeping things while you all are getting settled. Tom may have a get out of jail card, but get out of jail free card, but that's not going to stop me when he says something outrageous to say, who do you think you are, Joe Biden? Uh, so he, he knows he's got he's to be careful. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to, to have you here. Uh, my name is Andy Purdy. I've worked at Huawei for seven years in July. Uh, some of you know, and, and I'm happy to have individual sessions about our global assurance program because Joy gave an excellent summary, but there's a lot more detail that we can go into. Um, I was a lawyer for a long time. I was a federal prosecutor, a special counsel to the House Ethics Committee, a uh, congressional investigator, uh, chief counsel to the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Um, I've got a compliance background. I care deeply about the law and about facts. Uh, I joined Huawei, as I said, almost seven years ago, and I have never been prevented from saying what I believe uh, or doing what I think is, is right. And, um, uh, everything I was promised about the transformation of a great company, which is a continuous process, has been what has been taking place. And my opportunity, counterintuitive to some, maybe many, uh, that I can be an advocate for a safer cyberspace and a safer America is what I believe I have been doing. Um, we have uh, some, some little bites I wanted to emphasize, because our message, those of you who followed the FCC proceedings last year and, and some of the press accounts, we believe that it's important, and experts agree, to address cybersecurity risk, supply chain risk in a comprehensive manner, and it needs to be done relative to all vendors. There are certainly some amazing things I want to point out. Wayne Jones, who's the chief information officer of the Nuclear Security Administration, basically publicly said you shouldn't ban individual companies. You've got to mitigate the risk from software from everybody. I think he still has his job, but it was, uh, it, it was heartening to see somebody speak out. Uh, the second bullet, Within the last couple of weeks, a couple of Trump administration people have emphasized part of our core message. And they're saying that the U.S. approach to cybersecurity has to be country and company agnostic. I mean, you, you've got to think that sounds kind of funny, but that's the direction we're going. But the reality is when you look at Kirsten Nielsen, and I worked with her back uh, when I was with DHS and she was on the National Security Council uh, before she left DHS, um, she mentioned in her State of the Homeland address uh, that America is not secure in cyberspace. We don't have the kinds of comprehensive approaches yet that some other countries are, are finalizing. I believe the U.S. government in the last nine months with some of the efforts coming out of the Secure Technology Act, um, efforts of NIST, they're creating a Federal Acquisition Council, that the U.S. is moving toward a comprehensive approach, is moving toward an approach that can be country and company agnostic, but we're not there yet. So what do we have? We have specialized risk mitigation plans that we can talk about that meet the requirements of the government. Very interesting uh, report from uh, Sue Gordon, the principal deputy of the Director of National Intelligence, um, uh, a, a week or so ago. She came out publicly and said, it's, it's not a question of backdoors and Huawei products, because we can test for that. That's a pretty big admission. That's part of what we've been saying, is you've got to test for that. So she's saying, OK, there's backdoors. And that's not a, a, you know unsubstantial challenge to do the testing. I'm not saying it is, but it's very, very important. And then she said, listen to this, and some of you might see something that doesn't seem quite right about this, but uh, the U.S. government is very worried that China can compel the companies who own the equipment to provide data back to the government. Who owns the equipment? We don't own the equipment. You guys own the equipment. The, the, the various tiers of the communication sector in the United States own the equipment. You know the special processes that we have in place. You know that we're, our, the Huawei network's not connected to your network that's going to send all the data back. You know that you guys have the ability to monitor the traffic. So it, it is interesting that that comes down as that's the problem. And when you look at some of the most recent stuff where they're saying, oh, after they said that Huawei's the devil incarnate, then they said, oh, and we're worried about this China law that's going to force Huawei to send this confidential information back. <laughs> Knowing full well, that they don't think the law matters at all. They think we would do it regardless. But the, the, the great thing is that we don't have the access, the protections are in place to help make sure that there's no ability that's unmonitored to send anything back anywhere. So um, most U.S. allies, and the U.S. government has, has got to be shocked, and I was in Warsaw for two weeks when uh, Vice President Pence and Secretary Pompeo came and you know, met with the government, met with a, a, a lot of media folks. 
that the U.S. allies have really been pushing back on the U.S. for several reasons. One is there's no evidence of cybersecurity wrongdoing by Huawei in the world. The benefits of Huawei technology warrant proven risk mitigation measures. And you, you saw Angela Merkel came out, and she may still be a little annoyed that we were listening on our cell phone conversations a, a, a couple years ago. And frankly, I think a number of our allies in, in Europe kind of feel like the U.S. can be a bully and that the U.S. has a double standard in gathering intelligence around the world, that we will use American companies. And, and God knows, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a loyal American. I, I want us to be safe, and I want us to, to go the extra mile. The government official from Australia was asked, what about the evidence of wrongdoing against Huawei? He said, we don't need evidence. We're a sovereign country. They can bar Huawei with no evidence whatsoever. And that's true. They can. Um, so risk mitigation. We believe it's about risk mitigation. And the US doesn't have the program in place. So what has the US done? They have used a special kind of risk mitigation. And you see it with Nokia and Ericsson. They're called national security agreements in that situation. They're government monitored. And it, you, know, you have to trigger a certain statute to do it. But those are risk mitigation agreements monitored by the government. And think about Nokia for a second. Nokia has a huge joint venture with Shanghai Bell, which is owned by the China government. They do extensive operations, R&D, assembly and manufacturing in China, despite that connection with the China government. So they operate in the United States under a national security agreement. We're not asking that we not be tested or evaluated. We're not asking that we not have any kind of program that monitors what we do. In fact, I say we need the kinds of measures, because the fact that there has been no wrongdoing in the past, that's not relevant. We've got to protect ourselves. And we can only protect ourselves by comprehensive measures that provide assurance and transparency. And that's what we're talking about. So there is a national security agreement governing Nokia. And we're, we're not saying, oh, well, we want to do this or that. We're saying to the US government, talk with us. There are risk mitigation agreements that you have found adequate to protect America. Let's talk about having those kinds of risk mitigation agreements uh, in place for us. The point that some of you know about, and if not, we can talk about another time, the Secure Network Access Program, where we only use trusted laptops. And those laptops are only after permission is given by the customer. And those log and record every keystroke of the connection to your, to your systems. Um, we think that's a pretty good system. If we need a stronger one, uh, we can talk about it. So news coming out of Germany today, and it's, it's very much of a moving target. The US government has asked Germany to come up with, once they found out that Germany was not going to block Huawei from being in their 5G networks. Um, they said they want Germany to come up with an objective and transparent program for evaluating the risk. And so Germany is set forth on a process a little accelerated, you know, ahead of the United States to address the risk from all vendors. And this uh, representative today uh, from uh, the State Department uh, is saying that's positive that Germany's doing that. We think it's positive too. And hopefully, the European Union will learn from what Germany's doing. Hopefully, America and Australia and others will learn from what Germany's doing, coming up with practices and mechanisms that provide assurance and transparency. And that's really what we're talking about. I want to save some time for questions, but I want to turn to uh, Craig Spiesel. Um, as was at least implied by Joy, we're not paying Craig to be here, and he's not here as an advocate for Huawei. Let me just make that clear. He is a subject matter expert who's been one of the leaders, not just in the United States, but in the world, in coming up with principles and standards around Internet of Things. So his organization, the Online Trust Alliance, did an engagement with like 70 organizations around the world, the kind of comprehensive approach that's needed for cyber supply chain risk. The Online Trust Alliance has now been incorporated into the Internet Society. He served on the Communications Regulatory Group, the, the CISRIC that you've heard a lot about, that has also provided guidance, as you know, on 5G and, and IoT. Uh, and he's been a leader on the advisor to the, to the White House on, on various privacy issues. He lived through the major revamp, you may have remembered a number of years ago, when, when Bill Gates launched a major initiative because they had a lot of issues with the software development practices of Microsoft. So, so he lived you know, through, that, through that process and that process most recently of how to move forward with IoT so that we have requirements that provide assurance and transparency. So we're, we're very pleased that, uh, that Craig could join us today. Craig Spiesel.